for if there's any like questions for clarification or something. But uh, if not, I guess we will continue the discussion and go deeper to the issues in next panel discussions. Uh, so thank you, Dorothy. We will continue, and Dorothy will be joining the second uh, panel discussion later on. But first, we will have a Heta Elena Heiskanen. Please welcome. Heta will be uh, moderating the first panel discussion. And I could ask already Matti and Phyllis also to come here uh, to have take the floor and microphones. Uh, Heta is the uh, senior specialist in the Finnish Ministry of the Environment, and uh, there her work is connected with the Finnish Climate Change Panel and Climate Policy. As a researcher, she has specialized uh, in international human rights, law, and environmental matters as well. But possibly you could explain more about your background, and I give the floor to you. Thank you so much. Um, dear all, we are here because we have some serious issues with the planet, right? Um, and I think I just have really bad news. Uh, the IPCC is very clear that half of the population of the whole planet is living in the vulnerable areas where their human rights are in great risk because of climate crisis half of the population of the whole planet. Uh, the United Nations is also very clear that uh, climate crisis is not just an environmental problem. It is also a human rights problem. Uh, it's actually one of the most severe and more, most troublesome problem we have. And this have not been only a one statement from the United Nations. Uh, but they have been repeating this for many years. Uh, climate crisis is a crisis of uh, disabled people. It is a human, cri uh, human rights crisis of uh, children. It is a human rights crisis of indigenous people. It is a human rights crisis of women, uh, elderly people, all the vulnerable groups. Every one of us is experiencing climate crisis. Uh, and today I, I have privilege to have two people who have not been just crying and became anxious about this, this news, but they have chosen to act for human rights and for the environment. So uh, I have a great privilege to have a, a friend of mine, Phyllis Omida, from far away from Kenya here today. She's a very wise and brave woman uh, from Mombasa area. Uh, she is uh, an activist with a really big heart. She's been uh, uh, defending the rights of local people in Kenya uh, against uh, lead poisoning and different kind of environmental degradation. And she's been not just going out to the street, but actually litigate uh, for the rights of the people. And uh, she's been listed also as one of the most influ influential people of the world. So we are really privileged to have you here, Phyllis. Really. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and then we have uh, Matti uh, Gattanen from uh, Finnish, uh, uh, Finnish Association for Nature Conservation. And uh, you have a background as an environmental lawyer. So uh, you are using uh, most of the legal measures uh, of Finland, I, I guess, and you are specialized in this, practically realizing human rights in, in practice and environmental protection. So I'm very pleased to have you here today. Nice to be here. Yes. So uh, I started with the bad news, and I think I, I will share a little bit of good news as well uh, from Finland, because it's very topical that last week our parliament approved a new climate act. It's a good news, and we have not been celebrating that as much as we did, uh, for instance, ice hockey uh, championship. <laughs> but I think we should also celebrate, at least today, uh, a little bit about our Climate Act also, because I'm really proud that we have uh, established and accepted, for instance, a new Sami Council for Climate Change. 
in the Climate Act. It's going to be binding. I think this is something that is uh, establishing a strong standing that uh, Indigenous people will have a more uh, strong standing in the climate policy in future in Finland. Also, we did human rights assessment about the Climate Act. So we uh, tried to be really transparent and show that, well, the reform will, will uh, strengthen, strengthen these rights of participation, for instance. And we added there, uh, for instance, mentioning of uh, just transition. But let's go now to your work. So um, tell briefly, Phyllis, about your work on human rights and um, how you use the right to a healthy environment in action. And has it been a uh, useful tool for your activism? What do you think? Um, so when we started our work back home in Kenya in 2009, uh, the country had not yet recognized the rights to a clean and healthy environment. And it was very hard because we were left with only trying to find a political solution for a community of 3,000 people who had been exposed to heavy metal poisoning, um, lead poisoning. And therefore we had no avenue really um, to access justice um, and effective remedies for the Owinohuru community. However, in 2010, Kenya um, promulgated a new, a new uh, constitution, and in, within that constitution, uh, Article 42 recognized the right to a clean and healthy environment. And uh, with this recognition, the um, Kenyan jurisdiction uh, uh, implemented um, the Land and Environment Court in Kenya where uh, land and environment defenders could bring cases uh, that touched on their communities. And therefore in 2016, we uh, brought a case to court, a class action litigation challenging the responsibility of six state agencies and two corporations towards the right to a clean and healthy environment. We were also asking the court for some declarations in terms of uh, access to information and public participation rights of the community because we believe that this had been violated uh, during the licensing process of the, of the smelter. And uh, the uh, case ran from 2016 up to 2020 where uh, the Land and Environment Court granted the Unohuru community uh, remedies uh, running up to 12 million US dollars and uh, they granted Center for Justice the responsibility of cleaning up the environment and uh, uh, allocated uh, 7 million US dollars towards that. It was uh, quite uh, a huge victory Let's for the community. For <laughs> Thank you so much. It was quite a huge victory for, for the community and uh, uh, quite unfortunately, uh, the Chief Justice uh, decided to stay, the, to stay the execution of the decree and the two state agencies went to uh, the Court of Appeal to appeal the case. So we are now at the appeal stage. Uh, we'll be back in court on July uh, 4th. And uh, we are still hoping for the best from the Kenyan jurisdiction. Um, just to mention, however, um, that the, the, the recognition of the right to a clean and healthy environment in our case, uh, for example, gave us a very good tool to use to protect the community's rights. However, uh, there needs to be goodwill from the states um, because at the same time that the Winohuru community was battling with lead poisoning, I know that also in Flint, Michigan, in the U.S., there's a community that has been, had been exposed to lead poisoning. Whereas their levels were very low, around 35, our levels were very high, up to 420 micrograms per deciliter of lead in blood. Um, the U.S. Attorney General, however, ensured that they had sat with the community and the community uh, legal team, and the community was compensated despite the fact that the U.S. does not recognize the right to a clean and healthy environment. While Kenya, on the, other, on the other hand, recognizes the right to a clean and healthy environment, and yet it is the state itself that is fighting against um, the people of Oinohuru's rights to access justice uh, through the legal means. So the goodwill of, of uh, states, of member states, um, has to be there 
for us to actually achieve uh, this for our people. Yeah, thank you for sharing this powerful story. Uh, Matti, how about you? What is the meaning of uh, human rights and right to a healthy environment uh, in your work? Yeah, we do use those, not mainly in the daily basis, but weekly basis on our appeals that they are still on the background. I was thinking about that we only had like, those environmental rights in 1995, so it's not too long ago in Finland too. So we have still cases like in land use and building rights act that we don't have uh, access to justice. So it really helps in those cases that we have like this constitutional rights so we can maybe have access to justice in that way so we do use those but it's not in the mm, in the forefront of our work but they are still significant part of our work here too right yeah um it's really good to hear that uh, it's in, in, in use both in Kenya and in Finland. Uh, well, for many years I used to be a researcher and then I was attending seminars like this before COVID and people were asking me uh, quite many times like, are you a researcher on human rights or are you a researcher on environmental law? And this was repeated year after years and, I had, and they were kind of uh, waiting that I kindly say that, well, I'm a human rights researcher or I am a researcher on environmental rights. And I always repeat them, I'm both, that these issues are interlinkage. Uh, they, they have uh, interlinkage. And uh, uh, this was uh, my experience for many years, but, and I think uh, inherently the reason was that uh, the human rights approach to environment was not mainstreamed yet. But I've seen many promising signs that maybe nowadays when someone starts a research report, um, she or he will not find these questions uh, every time. But how do you find the collaboration between the environmental movement and human rights movements in your experience? Are they uh, cooperating with each, each other? Are they doing parallel work or how is it? Is there dialogue? Uh, maybe if Matti starts first and then Phyllis. I find it at least on, for example, in law reforms that we have ongoing in Finland too, that we usually find our, ourselves like with Sami people and our organization on the same side. So the goals are really similar. So we can have benefits in each other on the, how we can push legislation in Finland. That, that's, good and we have like this unofficial co co work all the time so I think in that sense it's it's like a very good very good that we are you can feel it it's it's in a daily basis we are in the same size you could say side you could say that so yeah left alone with these issues with uh, environmental NGOs it's great and Phyllis how do you find in your work I think in Kenya it has taken some time for the human rights community to accept uh, environmental rights. Uh, for many years, uh, when you spoke about the environment in Africa, people would think about the wildlife, the elephants, the trees, but they would not think about access to information and public participation and access to effective remedies. So it has been a big challenge uh, being accepted into the human rights world. Um, we, we, the, the work that we do is, na is neither accepted by the conservationists or the human rights people. So we are right in between. And it has been a very big challenge, even uh, with the donor community, to uh, speak to them about uh, linkages between human rights and the environment. But I believe that slowly everyone is seeing, and with the recognition now of the UN Human Rights Council of the right to a clean and healthy environment, I believe that uh, many human rights organizations will now start um, looking at it from, from our lens and, uh, and accepting that violating uh, the, the right to a clean and healthy environment inherently violates 
other rights like the right to health, the right to life, the right, socioeconomic rights, um, and, and other rights. So this has been my experience uh, in Kenya when it comes to these linkages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you both see kind of the trend that it's going <laughs> towards the point where human rights organizations are standing with the environmental organizations together and finding the same points. Yeah, it's very promising. I think it's better to have a you know wider community uh, to, to back up with these things. Good to hear. So uh, let's continue with the cooperation questions. Um, one of the key messages that the IPCC, for instance, had was that we need everyone on board to uh, solve climate crisis. So it can't be just left for the politicians or left for the researcher or left for the NGOs, but we need everyone, industries, cities, legislators, artists, NGOs, indigenous people, we need like everyone. And uh, I think in Finland, uh, for, ex for instance, in this climate policy context, we've been trying to make uh, wide uh, public consultations. And in one of the consultations uh, in recent years, we had even uh, over 18,000 people attending in infinite scales. It's a lot. So I think that also uh, the societal actors are really willing to uh, cooperate and, and be involved. And also we've been launching a new uh, roundtable on climate change that is led by the Prime Minister and there are uh, representatives from different st stakeholders, also from the youth and the indigenous communities, uh, to have dialogue how to make this just transition in the right way. But how do you find uh, in your own countries um, how is the collaboration between different actors like civil society, state, businesses and so on? Maybe Phyllis you could start. Uh, my experience is that it has been very challenging. Um, I think uh, the civil society has absorbed this very fast and very positively, but uh, the corporate and uh, state actors are still quite resistant um, in recognizing uh, the times that we are in and the fact that uh, for sustainable development to happen, we need to recognize uh, this, the rights to a clean and healthy environment. And therefore, uh, a lot of uh, civil society actors, including ourselves, have been mobilizing and trying to create consensus, especially with state and corporates, um, because uh, we cannot protect the environment and our people without uh, all of us being on board and agreeing that this has to be done. I know that when it comes to corporates, it means uh, touching on their profits. When it comes to government, it means uh, they look at it from an economic point of view. And, uh, and from this point, they are a bit quite resistant. Um, however, I believe that the NGOs have got it and uh, they are working towards uh, the change. And I believe that in future, uh, we are going to see change. Yeah. 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 So you're hopeful? I'm very hopeful. Yeah. I would like to um, add a little question to you because I know you've been in a risk of your, you know, having personal risks and uh, having these uh, threats and so on. So how do you find, how, how, who have been giving you protection on the times when you've been seeing harassment or risk of, you know, kidnapping of children or these kind of things? Who are your partners at, in those kind of risky situations? Um, I think I was very, very uh, privileged to have uh, the support of different various actors in society. Um, the UN especially, I remember the time when not only myself but the people that I work with came under a big threat. The, the UN uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights released a statement requiring Kenya to protect us. They did the same thing when one of my colleague's child was kidnapped well, when we were putting the case in court to stop him from testifying. And also reason, most recently, uh, after we won the case, um, some goons were sent into the Winohuru community to burn down the community. And uh, several houses were torched. We lost 11 houses in total. Um, and uh, this was quite recent in 2020, immediately after uh, the court ruled in our favor. And I saw a lot of uh, support from the international NGOs especially. 
Um, I know civil rights defenders came out very strongly. They helped me to relocate some of our members, uh, the land and environment defenders. I know that Kios, the Finnish Foundation for Human Rights, was monitoring our work, documenting and was in touch with us uh, throughout the process. Um, organizations like Frontline Defenders. We also have uh, some of the embassies in Kenya that uh, stood with us during this time. So there has been a lot of support for me. But unfortunately for other grassroots defenders, because um, together with Kios, we convened the Center for Justice, convinced the um, uh, Kenyan uh, network of land and environment defenders. And within this network, there are, even now as we speak, there are defenders that are hiding. They are in hiding because they have been criminalized. I know uh, there's a conservationist called Rabi Ahawa who has been trying to protect uh, elephant territory, uh, two, 200 elephant territory that is, has been earmarked for an army camp. And she has been raising questions with the army, where do we take the 200 elephants? And unfortunately, she has been criminalized. There are cases that have been brought against her. And also Amnesty Kenya has worked with us in trying to um, approach the, the state security agencies to uh, try and isolate these two issues so that the security agencies are not used to repress her, her rights. We know also there's uh, a female, another female defender from the south coast of Kenya who took upon an industry that had been set up in the community and is polluting. And she has been arrested, she has been arraigned in court, her children have been threatened, she gets text messages, and she's also in hiding right now. So more so we have seen this trend when it's women rights defenders. The repression comes down so strongly against them. We are very grateful that we convene this network. We are able to reach these people on time. We were able to protect Rabia when uh, the CID had been sent to her house to go and break in and, and, and uh, take her. And we were afraid that even if they pick her up, you know, Kenya, there we've had a lot of extrajudicial killings. We were afraid that she might end up dead because she's also standing against a lot of profit well, for individuals um, who are, who are, who gain to profit from the KDF camp. And therefore we managed to, to rescue her. Uh, we managed to send her to a, protect, uh, uh, a secure place for protection and then we organized meetings with the police to talk to them about her case. Mm -hmm. And this in some way um, de-escalated the issue and gave us some kind of leeway to arrange for legal uh, uh, counsel to protect her also yeah. in with using the courts. So that is the situation as it is now. Sounds really... Like tough situation to me and it's I'm, um, I'm happy that there have been so many different actors stand standing by you and with you but it's a powerful message for all of us that there are many activists that would need you know safety network like you and uh, yeah thank you for sharing uh, Matti in Finland I think it's slightly different kind of cooperation uh, yeah, and collaboration I hope I how would you define it you have some big problems. I think we have some problems, but not in the same level, but I think we have some trust, uh, lack of trust in some industry, industries in lack, like a couple of years now, maybe, for example, a mining industry is that something like the civil society doesn't have really good trust on, so there's a possibilities to come together, but I think there's still, still, still some, um, I think there has to be some legislation reforms and stuff like that, that we can really build up the trust again. So, so and also we have many state-owned companies in Finland, like in the forest industry that uh, are still, um, and the civil society doesn't have the same, same, <laughs> same, same direction. So I think there's, there's possibilities and um, things to go further, but I don't really know the what what's the what's the like medicine for that. It, it maybe it's just a continuous cooperation. I think so. Right. Let's uh, <laughs> continue to seek the medicine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
thank you. So um, the basis for um, basis is that the climate action and biodiversity action is usually benefiting human rights as well. However, we have already learned and heard today from the previous speakers that uh, climate action can also increase uh, some human rights problems. So there's a risk of increasing, uh, for instance, increase of electrification requires, for example, a lot of different kind of minerals from different uh, parts of the world. Uh, this can be contrary to the local biodiversity uh, or local human rights. And in the same time, the conservation activities can also have a, a negative implications on human rights if uh, people will be re uh, forced to re relocate themselves and, and so on. So uh, what do you think? How to ensure that both human rights and environmental aims can be respected during this very tricky area of uh, climate crisis and climate action? Please, what do you think? Do you have good practices? I think the best way is to not to isolate these two. You cannot isolate uh, human rights and isolate the, the right to a clean and healthy environment. If we handle this uh, together, and there is a big possibility that we can protect people on the planet. Um, we have seen, for example, uh, the rights of indigenous groups in Kenya, uh, like the Ogiek. These are forest people. This is, they know how to coexist with nature. However, uh, the narrative uh, when we are conserving the environment is that these people need to leave the forest for, for us to conserve the, the forest. So where does the right of the Ogiek end uh, and the right uh, to a clean and healthy environment begin? So the only way is to recognize that these are intertwined. We need to recognize their indigenous rights. We need to recognize their right to live, to, to continue living their own way of life. And uh, history is enough proof that these people have lived very, um, uh, they have managed to coexist very well with nature. So why are we interfering with them, you know? So uh, I believe that is the solution that, that we have. Let's take back this solution home with us and make it real, right? Uh, really nicely summarized. Matti, what do you think? Do you agree with this? Yeah, I agree. And uh, maybe a couple of things. Like Dorothy pointed out earlier, we have like the Sami people uh, think still that we should implement that ILO agreement that would be one, one thing to do in Finland to implement that. And I, th I have hope for in EU that, exam for example, that uh, corporate uh, sustainable due diligence directives it's not perfect, but it's a good start. That kind of legislation, of course, Finland is part, Finland is part of that, and we are not. We are usually go to the EU to get the best reforms. I think so that that way. But I think those we have to come together, and there's not maybe not not focus on the national legislation, but for the international um, legislation. So that's that's the way to go ahead. Right. I think we have uh, time for one question from the audience. Uh, if anyone is brave enough uh, to comment or pose a question, please. I can't see any hands rising. Well, in that case, I think we can uh, discuss later during the break and I want to really like warmly uh, thank you for this discussion. I think you brought a lot of uh, valuable points here. And uh, Phyllis, I hope that you can bring some rain from here back to Kenya because it has been so dry there and I'm really worried about that. And, uh, and for both of you, both Phyllis and, and Matti, I hope uh, that may the law be with you yeah. and uh, may the law be with the nature's uh, side too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate.